Welcome to Mama Broad's interview of the week. Today I'm joined with Lee Matthews, a registered Australian psychologist and founder of Therapy in Barcelona. They offer counselling and coaching in English to adults, children, adolescents and families from Barcelona's international community. Hi Lee, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Today we're going to be discussing uh, COVID and why expats have that extra resilience in these difficult times. About a month ago, Lee, you wrote an article for us on our blog, Mama Broad Life, and I'd just like to discuss that article in a little bit more detail. So first of all, can you define COVID ambiguity? I think COVID ambiguity is just sitting with like two different feelings that we have in this moment. So, for instance, with lockdown, we may have, on the one hand, been actually kind of happy to be able to have cuddles in bed with our kids or a slow breakfast with our families. But on the other hand, it was it became incredibly um, suffocating and difficult to be at home with everyone. Um, the the remote schooling or what was really crisis schooling because none of us have been trained to be remote schoolers or teachers um you know that that was really hard and you know i think i put in that article that like 70 percent of parents in america had rated that as like the most stressful thing in in the whole lockdown scenario um so it it's this space is the ambiguity of this space where we have to sit with competing emotions and that's really challenging yeah and it can actually provoke a bit of guilt that we want you know our kids to to be at school and not at home but I think they're very natural and normal feelings to have. So I guess an example of this ambiguity would be for example um, I'm really happy that my kids have gone back to school it's given me space, uh, much needed space. And my children are really happy to be back at school. They have a, they're back in, you know, have a schedule. Um, they're with friends, they're socializing, they're enjoying themselves. But at, at the same time, I have those feelings of, uh, is it okay for them to be at school with so many other people? Um, I feel sorry for them wearing a mask all day. You know, yeah. there are mixed feelings there. So that would be the ambiguity that you're talking about, right? Absolutely, yeah, and I think, it, it, again, it's simply just sitting, noticing those feelings and sitting with them and normalising them rather than judging ourselves for feeling either way, that it's okay those two things can go together. The other thing that you talk about is COVID uncertainty, which I think is an interesting concept. So my youngest child is 10, and he's the one that seems to be most anxious in this situation. And he will very often come home from school, ask questions about COVID, want to know, is he going to go to school tomorrow? Is he going to go to school next week? Will there be another lockdown? What's the best, best coping strategies for parents with children when they have a bit of anxiety or they, they're asking a lot of questions and we don't have the answers? I think actually just simply being honest and authentic with our children about this being a challenging time and we we do not know rather than pretending engaging in toxic positivity which is everything will be all right you know you'll be fine school will go on like no we're not going to go into a lockdown um versus some kind of denial um you know kind of shutting our kids down and saying don't worry about that you know, I think we do need to engage with their anxieties and reflect them back to them. You know, this feels hard, doesn't it? It feels weird not to know what's going to happen and, you know, the other class next door to you has been sent home for quarantine. But it's it's okay. We're all in this together. And then, like, you know, I think setting aside a little bit of time each day, like half an hour at the end of school just to air um, anxieties. I know something I used to do with my son and I still sometimes do it was to ask was it a mad day, a sad day, a good day or a bad day and very often kids will just go like I don't know it was, it was good 
But that really paid off for me one day when he kind of in, I think, P4, like threw himself in my arms and started crying and said it was a sad day. And I think what, because if we just open up the space, we allow room, but also not to push it. Maybe they're okay and they don't have to talk about it and then come back to being in the moment. And I know that that was something that resonated with you, Jane, in the article, which is about, you know, that we're in this global mindful, mindfulness class, you know, that we're, there is no escape from the uncertainty we have now. And we've always had uncertainty in our lives. We never know what's going to happen in the future. And, you know, spiritual teachers, psychologists have always been telling us live in the now, the power of the now. Um, it, it's a lot easier when there's not a global pandemic to just, you know, be able to make plans for the future and pretend that life isn't uncertain. But now that's not possible. And so actually we're confronting, like, the reality of life, which is that uncertainty is something that prevails at all times in our lives. We're just more cognizant of it now. And so it's a really positive thing that we have to, you know, without even knowing that we're doing it, we have to keep coming back to this moment and not getting lost in stories about how horrible this is or I don't know. It's just this is how we function is to come back to playing together eating dinner together, preparing dinner together, like having our rituals and having our feet on the ground, anchoring ourselves in the moment that we have with each other. It's an interesting point that you make because I think that most of the time we do feel that we're in control of what's going on in our lives. We, we make plans what we're going to do tomorrow, what we're going to do next week, what we're going to do next month. And we do feel that we have a control over what's happening. But actually, you're right. We have no control whatsoever. <laughs> and COVID has just brought that to the forefront, hasn't it? Yes. And, I mean, I think our brains, we know, work on predictability. They crave predictability. And so at the moment, this kind of level of uncertainty and not being able to predict the future puts us all on some level in a state of threat um, and so we're all living with some baseline level of anxiety um, which means makes it even more imperative that we come back to the moment to what we're doing to having some routine controlling what we can control which is just our day-to-day -day, our day-to-day -day routines our well-being, taking, getting enough sleep, looking after the pillars of our well-being, sleep, nutrition, exercise, connecting with people in our lives who we love, even if that's by technology. I find that um, particularly during this period, I'm taking break a break from social media quite often. It might last for an hour, it might last for a day, or it might last for a week, depending on my mood. But I, I do often feel that I have accepted... I was the situation that we're living through and I'm just getting on with it. And then I'll read an article or see somebody's opinion about something or a photograph or a comment on social media and it will bring all those emotions back again. And I realise that I haven't accepted anything. Um, and sometimes it's just easier or, or more healthy maybe to take a step back from everybody else's opinion. One thing that's really important and we... You know, is it stepping away from the news? Like there's a lot of statistics. You know, someone asked me in Australia, you know, how's COVID there? How are the numbers? And I said, look, I haven't been looking because, you know, their numbers that can seem really mountainous and, and scary and it's not helpful to me to be able to move through this. Um, so I would really urge people definitely to contain their ingestion of news and what people are saying on forums. It can be quite um, devastating, I think, to see people in your own community who, you know, are writing on social media, social media like Facebook forums and they're very, very distressed and anxious. I think one thing is to chip in there and give some support and say hey like that's really normal and it's going to be okay and like you know continue to reach out but also yeah kind of quarantine yourself from the virus of panic and anxiety that seems 
to be quite at the forefront at the moment. But I did want to say, Jane, you said you realise that when you start to feel overwhelmed that you thought you were at a, a space of acceptance but you weren't. That's because that shifts. It's that yes. cycling through the stages and it's really normal, yeah. But, um, yeah, absolutely, take care of your mind and what you put in it. That's what one thing you can control. Just to, to finish, Lee, can you, um, one of the things that you mentioned in your blog post was that you felt that expats have that little extra resilience um, mm -hmm. and that or perhaps are able to cope with, with what's going on in the world at the moment. Can you just expand a little bit on what you meant by that? Yeah, I think that when we move to a new country, when we expatriate or immigrate, um, particularly to a country that's so different, like Spain, um, we are thrown into a ground of uncertainty and unknowns. If you think about the cultural iceberg, which is where you have an iceberg and on the tip, you know, the language and the food and the clothes will be different. But underneath that is all the concepts of time, concepts of beauty, concepts of, um, you know, social closeness, social proximity. Um, and that is really destabilizing. That's when, and, and the culture shock, cultural adjustment curve really looks like um, the Kula Ross grief curve, and that we have, well, we don't have a honeymoon period when there's a loss, but when we first arrive in a country, we have a honeymoon period, then we have culture shock, and culture shock incorporates grief because we're also missing that we have lost certainty, that we've lost our sense of the rules and the norms and the cultural values of where we are. Like it's it's really similar to this in that we just don't, we're still trying to find our feet. We don't know even if we'll stay in the country on, in some cases. Um, so that's an uncertainty about the future. Everything is new. And this is like in COVID, the rules change all the time too with COVID. Now we can only have six people together. It was 10 before. Um, we have to wear the masks all the time, but that might change again. Will there be a lockdown? Um, so we're never able to really like hold on to a particular rule or way of being at the moment, apart from, you know, how we conduct our everyday lives. Now, what expats do to cope with that is if they do, if they do it, and they might do it like not consciously, but there's a radical acceptance. This is different. There's not comparing, not this is, um, this is worse. It's like, this feels worse, but it's just different and I can handle it. There's that self-soothing that comes in, like I'm okay, I'm doing really well. There's also creating pockets of calm, connection, you know, self-care to be able to um, top oneself's coping skills up, yeah, like to, the capacity to be resilient. Um so I mean I think that's why expats really have these skills without even necessarily knowing it because I've had also being disconnected from family and friends, you know, um, that social distancing. When we first immigrate or expatriate, it can be really lonely, you know, and we have to get good at putting we, we had to get good, prop not in the past, people wrote letters, I suppose, but now we had to get the Skype going. We had to stay connected to our fans. And it's something I've seen in therapy is reminding people, hey, have you been in touch with your family and friends this week? Have you made that time? Have you made it something that's an integral part of your week? And they feel better when they start to do that because connection's really important. So we've been doing this before, Jane, like as expats, we've been in this kind of separation from other people, uncertainty, grief. We can do it. It's, it's a very interesting comparison because you're right about everything that you've said there about the expat life, but perhaps we haven't thought about it in the terms that you've just spoken about because moving abroad was a choice, or for most of us, who have moved abroad it's a choice and therefore we feel that we that we can cope with it that yes it's different but we've chosen to do this we want to do this and therefore we will kind of 
move forward with it. And we go back to the whole point where COVID has been thrust upon us. What can I find from this that isn't so terrible, that's like a silver lining, it, you know, that it, what can I reap? Yeah, and and I think that's that's really important. I, it's really hard. It's it's like it's cold comfort. It's a very it's a kind of bitter pill to swallow. And I know that for some people, they can be resistant to that. Like, how can I find meaning from this? It's too hard. It's not fair. It's well, because we can, because we have that power, that capacity for cognitive reappraisal or putting a different frame around our situation. Yeah. It, fascinating talking to you, Lee. We could go on all day, but unfortunately, we run out. Of <laughs> if people want to find out more about therapy in Barcelona, I guess the best place is to go to the, your website, which is there along the bottom of the screen right now, and there they can find your email address and phone number if they want to get in yeah, contact. That's right. Really enjoy talking to you today, Lee. Thanks. I really appreciate it and I hope we can talk about something else in future. Yeah, Thank we you will. so much. <laughs>